In the previous week, I defined partial derivatives and gradients. These were the first steps in understanding the rate of change of a scalar field. This week, I will define several more objects that can be built out of the partial derivatives, each of which will capture some aspect of the total rate of change of a scalar field. And at the end, I'll try to wonder what, if anything, should be the complete generalization of the derivative. For now, in this video, I'll start with the directional derivative. Let me return to partial derivatives and give them some reinterpretation. Take a scalar field on R3. So in the variables x, y, and z, the partial del f del x is the rate of change of f in the variable x. The domain here is R3. So at any point in the domain, del f del x measures how much the scalar changes while moving in the x direction. What is that direction? It is the 1, 0, 0 direction. And note, this is a local direction. At any point, I can look in the x direction. So the partial in y is likewise the rate of change in the direction 0, 1, 0. And the partial in z is the rate of change in the direction 0, 0, 1. Three local direction vectors, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, three possible directions at any point. However, there are other local directions, in fact, infinitely many. What about the rates of change in those local directions? The directional derivative considers this. Since a scalar field is defined in Rn, any direction of movement in Rn defines a rate of change in that direction. I measure the rate of change by a local direction vector, u. However, I need to be careful here. I only care about the direction of this local direction, not the length of it as a vector. Therefore, for this de definition, I will assume that u is a unit vector, a vector of length 1. Very frequently, when direction is all that I care about, I will use a unit vector to get rid of the possibility of vectors of the same direction having different lengths. Then, there is a rate of change from any point in the domain in the local direction u. The derivative is given by a limit definition, as are all derivatives. It is written capital D subscript u of f, the derivative of the scalar field f in the direction u. At some point v in Rn, it is the limit of f of v plus hu minus f of v divided by h as h goes to zero. Now, this looks very much like the conventional derivative definition, but v and u are vectors, not scalars. From the point v, I move a little bit in the u direction by adding hu to v, and I take the limit as that movement goes to zero to get the instantaneous rate of change. This does recapture the limit definitions of the partial derivatives. The directional derivative in R3 is the in the unit direction e1 is the partial in x, and in the unit direction e2 is the partial in y, and finally the directional derivative in the unit direction e3 is the partial in z. If this notation is new to you, the unit vector e1 is the vector 1, 0, 0, the unit vector e2 is the vector 0, 1, 0, and the unit vector e3 is the vector 0, 0, 1. These are notations for the standard basis of Euclidean space. Alright, that's a nice definition, but I'd rather not calculate with a limit definition. Happily, there is a better way to calculate directional derivatives. Under the same assumptions, a scalar field f and a unit direction u, the directional derivative can be calculated as the dot product of the unit direction u with a gradient. Think about the rules of the dot product for a moment. The value of the dot product is equal to the length of the two vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. u is a unit vector, so it has length 1, so only the length of the gradient and the cosine remain. What this said is, is that the directional derivative, the rate of change in a particular direction, is measured by comparison with the gradient. When the angle is 0, the directions are the same, and the direction is the gradient direction, and that maximized the rate of change, which is what the gradient already did. It was the direction of greatest change. The change in other directions is exactly captured by this cosine, 
which measures how close any direction is to the gradient. Finally, I said that everything was going to be built out of the partials. Since the gradient is the vector of partial derivatives, this directional derivative is also calculated by the partial derivatives through the dot product. Let me consider some examples. Here is a graph of a scalar field in R2. I can draw arrows in the domain, in the x and y plane, and calculate the rate of change of the function in those directions. On the graph, this would be standing at some point on the graph and looking in some direction and asking what is the slope of the graph from that point in that direction. And this can be done at any point and in any direction in the plane. Here are some calculations with the same graph. The first two are the partials, the directional derivatives in the axis directions. For the third, I use the direction 1, 2, but I need the unit vector, so I take the direction 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5. Then I need the dot product with the gradient with the two partials. This is 1 over root 5 times the first partial, plus 2 over root 5 times the second partial. And the result is this combination, which will give the slope in the 1, 2 direction from any point with some coordinates x, y in the plane. If I want this, say, at a specific point, root pi, root pi in the plane, well then I replace x and y with root pi and calculate. And cosine of 2 pi is 1, so I get a result of 6 times the square root of pi over 5. This is the slope, positive so upward, at the point root pi, root pi, looking in the 1, 2 direction. Here is another graph. This is a very similar graph, but now the oscillations of the sine function moving outwards in concentric circles are damped by an exponential term. So the amplitude of the oscillations gets lower and lower as it goes out. I can ask the same question. Stand at a point above some point x, y in the plane and look in a particular direction and see what the slope of the graph will be from that point in that direction. Here are the calculations, this time in general. I've taken AB to be an arbitrary unit vector, that is the square root of A squared plus B squared equals one. And I've taken the two partials calculated by computer for this function, and then taken the dot product of AB with the gradient. So this is A times the X partial and B times the Y partial. Then again, I could look at a specific point, say again, root pi, root pi, just because it's a nice point to calculate for this function. I'm repeating myself, but it bears repeating. This is a derivative at a specific point in some specific direction. The point here is root pi root pi, and the direction here is left as the general unit vector AB. If I simplify this expression, evaluating that sine of 2 pi is 0 and cos of 2 pi is 1, I get this expression for the directional derivative in some direction AB for this damped oscillation function.